few moments to pray, a few seconds for thank you before the chaos hits, before the minutes get spent on playing all the roles you play this great God gave you one of the most important jobs to help mold and shape your little birds to build a nest until they learn to fly on their own on any given day. Your mom, wife, doctor, nurse, counselor, CEO, let mommy see where it hurts, coach and referee, disciplinarian, chef, event coordinator, accountant and creative, teacher and attendee of tea parties many days. You are a super shiro with no cape, just flats, or jeans, or sneakers, or yoga pants, ready to answer the mom's signal at any time. You are also a woman, a feeling, breathing, thinking, dreaming woman. Motherhood may have brought you a few extra curves, but it also taught you the power of words, of knowing your limitations, of finding strength and resting in weakness, that you are more than your morning routine, or all of the thoughts that invade your mind before you try to sleep. You were made for adventure. Not the kind where we put on a brave face just to save face in the face of insecurity and laundry and worries. God wants you to find the courage to be yourself, to remember the calling and the dreams, to remember the seeds he planted in your heart, to remember it only takes one step to start, to remember out of all your roles, hats, jobs, titles, you are first the daughter of an everlasting father who holds your hand at the precipice of all of life's steep hills and dangerous cliffs, who when the wind is whipping at your ears, when your mind is filled with can'ts and won'ts and should I's, reminds you that he's with you, that he is the one who makes you brave. He is the one who helps you face the day, gives you strength, gives you permission to be weak, gives you the boldness to speak, a quiet place to breathe, ears to hear the heart, eyes to see the dreams. We all long to be rescued, but we are not Lois Lane, searching for Superman or Gotham on the lookout for Bruce Wayne. The hero we live for has no flaws, no weakness, no kryptonite. He is love, mercy, and sacrifice, conqueror of death, creator of life, the hero of all heroes, the inventor of time. He is with you. You are not alone. Motherhood is an adventure. May you always have courage, boldness, and grace for the journey. Good morning. Uh, that video comes from our Mothers of Preschoolers uh, group. Uh, they meet on the second and fourth Tuesday of every month here as they wrap up their program year this coming uh, month. We uh, lift up Mother's Day this morning, and so I want to wish you a happy Mother's Day as well. I thought we'd start off with maybe a bit of a quiz this morning, find out if you know where Mother's Day comes from. Um, so uh, let's take a look at a few possible answers this morning. Here are three uh, possibilities. Did Mother's Day uh, come out of uh, Anna Jarvis, who organized Mother's Work Days back in 1858? Or was it in 1872 when Julia Ward Howe established a special day for mothers and for peace? Or, just three possibilities here, was it in 1914 when Congress passed a Mother's Day resolution pushed by Anna Jarvis, who happens to be Anne's daughter there from question A. So A, B, or C, and uh, whenever given a choice like that, the right answer is all of the above. No, it's always all of the above, right? With, with that much detail, you know the teacher is giving you the chance to say it's all of the above. All of those are uh, places where Mother's Day began. So no matter what answer you gave, you are at least partially correct. I will give you full credit this morning. Uh, so all of those are possibilities. Uh, let me just give you a little bit of uh, history on each one of those. Uh, Anna Jarvis. Um, no, I put... It's, it's Anne. This one's Anne. My bad on the PowerPoint. Anne Jarvis. There's her picture. She organized mothering clubs uh, in uh, the Virginia area, the West... Western Virginia area, and uh, she did it because she believed mothers had the power, like no one else, to improve social conditions. That if women learned what it was to make sure that uh, there was cleanliness in their communities and that the children were taken care of, that in fact whole communities could be improved. And so uh, she did great effort and great work, and then following the Civil War, she organized mother's clubs to plant uh, flowers on the graves of fallen Civil War soldiers. And because of their location there in Virginia, 
Uh, both northern and southern mothers were a part of these clubs, and much of the healing of our country came about through the work of mothers following the Civil War. Uh, Julia Ward Howe, also known for her work during the Civil War, she wrote the Battle Hymn of the Republic. You know, glory, glory, hallelujah, I'm almost done with school. Not that version exactly. But we're going we're gonna to sing, we're gonna sing a version coming up here in uh, 13 more school days to go. Uh, Memorial Day, we're going to sing the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Uh, it was written by Julia Ward Howe. Uh, she also wrote an appeal to womanhood throughout the world, which later was uh, called the Mother's Day Proclamation. And so she invited women around the world to join for a day of mothers and for peace. Uh, and finally, uh, Anne uh, Jarvis, uh, who is uh, the daughter of Anna Jarvis, uh, lifted up her mother as someone who she thought people should honor. And so she wrote, I hope and pray that someone sometime will found a memorial Mother's Day commemorating her, her mother, for the matchless service she renders to humanity in every field of life, for she is entitled to it. And so uh, her daughter there, Anna Jarvis, worked hard to get the Mother's Day passed by Congress in 1914. Now, as a sad and tragic note, just so you know, uh, she eventually uh, gets arrested for protesting on Mother's Day because she thinks chocolate and cards are not at all what she envisioned would become uh, the work of Mother's Day. She wanted people to really honor their mothers and not just give them cards and flowers. Uh, she ends up working herself uh, literally to exhaustion and she dies broken and penniless in a sanitarium uh, where the uh, Florist Association of America pays for her care. How's that for irony? All right. So those three ladies and their work contribute to what we today call Mother's Day, held on the second Sunday of May every year. Uh, we're going to be talking about freedom today and next week and on Memorial Day weekend. And Mother's Day is connected to that Memorial Day celebration, uh, not only because both of them occur in May, but because without mothers, there would not be the effort to have a Memorial Day. And because mothers are the ones who best understand the sacrifices necessary to live out the freedom that God intended for us to have. And so we're going to be talking about freedom and the cause of freedom, freedom for our children, freedom as followers of Christ, and on Memorial Day weekend, freedom within our country. Because freedom is one of those great gifts that we have as followers of Christ and as people who live in this great country that can too easily be misinterpreted or misunderstood. Uh, I want to encourage you to look at your sermon notes today. Uh, they're going to be designed the next couple of weeks to use for discussion, for Bible study, to use as small groups. Uh, even just that opening question. Uh, if, if you don't know how to start a conversation, I'm going to try to give you some icebreakers. And so in your sermon guide this morning, uh, it, just, it asks you to simply name your mother and your grandmother. And it's amazing to me how many people have to sometimes work to remember those actual names. And so it's a way to honor those ladies in our life simply by remembering who they were. I also want to tell you that I want us to be people who are in prayer and preparation to celebrate that freedom that we have from God and in our country on Memorial Day, as well as at the end of school. Getting done with school does not mean you are simply free to do whatever you want. It means you make plans for what God has next. And that bears a great deal of discipline and courage and preparation. In our country, we are blessed with the thought that our freedom is not something given to us by the government. Uh, the government does not give you freedom. By the way, your mom doesn't give you freedom either. They kind of go hand in hand, right? Never once growing up did your mom say, just do whatever you want. I don't care. That's not a, that's, nobody ever said that was my mom's favorite quote, right? In the Declaration of Independence, it says in the preamble that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, 
and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In our country, we believe that rights are not simply given to us by the state, but rather they are given to us by our creator, that God himself endows us with rights that no one can take away. No government, no politician, no president can ever take away those rights. That's what we believe as Americans. It's what makes us different and special from all the rest of the countries of the world. But in order for us to fully enjoy the freedom that we have, we must understand why those freedoms come from God. Uh, The freedom that I want to mention this morning is the freedom and also the right, and also the responsibility to teach our children. Freedom is not simply a standalone right. Freedom itself comes as something that has rights, and then also responsibilities. No one teaches your children better than you do in your own house. Public schools cannot undo what you teach your children. And by the way, public schools can't fix what you get wrong with your children either. It's why homes are so important. It's why mothers are the first and greatest teachers their children ever have. And so when we talk about the freedom we have to teach our children, it comes both as a right given to you by God as well as a responsibility entrusted to us. Uh, The west end of our building is designed for our children and our youth. And our commitment to our children and to our youth is essential for why we celebrate the freedom that God has given to us. Teaching our children in Sunday school, on Wednesday evenings, on Sunday nights, in our homes is a requirement for us in order to pass on the faith. If you come and worship on Sunday morning, but have never made a commitment to help with our children or our youth, you are missing the full responsibility of what it means to follow God. In the Old Testament, God called upon his people to teach his children. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 7, it says this, the foundational commandment of the Old Testament. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your heart. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. For God's people, teaching our children was a constant duty. And nobody knows the constant duty of teaching better than mothers. There is no moment at which mothers get to punch the uh, off-duty clock, right? There is no moment at which a mom says, well, um, I don't care. At least there shouldn't be. Here, one of the great tragedies of our culture is when parents step back from their responsibility, is when we give up that freedom and therefore the right and then the responsibility to teach our children. Our children are always watching us. Uh, One uh, mother uh, talked about the day that she was at home trying to get some things cleaned. Uh, It was a Sunday afternoon, maybe a rainy day like today. Maybe some of you are, well, not today. Take your mom out to lunch today. Don't make her clean house today. Goodness gracious, right? Some other Sunday when mom was cleaning house, right? Her youngest child was there with her, and uh, you know she would try to sweep, and, and she'd have this little tag-along behind her and would trip over her, and, and she went out to the kitchen to clean, and a little tag-along came behind her and was constantly sort of in the way, and she finally said, would you, would you please give me some space? Stop following me. 
And her daughter said, Mom, at Sunday school, we learned that we should walk in the footsteps of Jesus. But I can't see Jesus, so I'm just going to follow you. There is not a moment in which we are not impressing our children on how they should live. There is not a moment in which we don't have that right or responsibility. And there is the freedom that we have in our country to know that our children belong to their parents. That's the freedom we have. Now, some days it doesn't seem very free to do that. There's nothing free about children, nothing free about graduation, nothing free about much of anything. They estimate today that a child will cost you about a quarter of a million dollars from birth to 18 years old in diapers and formula and all that kind of stuff. So if any of you think that you know, you, you, your mom and dad don't care, just let them give you the bill. The commandments I give you today are to be on your heart and impress them on your children. That's in Deuteronomy 6. Now here's the problem when you continue to read the Old Testament. God's people forget the commandments over and over and over again. It's not like there's Deuteronomy 6 and then it's all good. Every generation requires a willingness to pass on their faith. In fact, our country's freedom depends on our willingness as citizens to be moral people. The only reason God gives the law is because of our sinful hearts. The only reason we have laws in our country, and more and more and more of them all the time, is because somebody broke them, because somebody started to do something that ultimately did not, uh, did not make any sense. And somebody said, we got to make a law. Laws will never fix the problems that depend on people's morality. Our country's freedom, the very essence of who we are, depends upon our willingness to recognize we are ultimately responsible beyond what any government can do for us. John Adams, president and one of the founders of our country, said this, Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. If if we expect to be people who simply live the way we want to and then complain about all that the government does, we have missed the great freedom of our country that our government is of the people and for the people and by the people. Our responsibility is to live as people who understand that our great burden is not to simply fulfill the law, right? Did you ever tell your kids, did you ever tell your kids, clean your room, clean your room, here's the law, clean your room, right? Maybe you made the mistake and you said, pick up the floor, I want to see this floor, and you walk in and everything's piled on the bed. (sighs) Then you got to say, now, clean off your bed, and then everything's in the hamper, and the hamper's like seven foot tall, filled with dirty clothes. You're like, now sort the clothes, and you end up with just piles out in the hallway. Oh, you can't make enough laws to make people do what they don't want to do. That's the constant struggle we have with freedom. Uh, Freedom is not doing what you want to do. That is a bad definition of freedom. Doing what you want to do is too often sin or chaos. And so one of the great discussions that we must have constantly together as a country and with our children is what does freedom look like? Because the devil would confuse us as to what freedom really means. Freedom for the devil is addiction, is anger, is fear, is loneliness. Freedom for the devil is to have everyone go their own way and do their own thing. Uh, Did you ever ever have that moment in your house, maybe when you were younger or with a child, who the child finally said, that's it, I'm leaving. They pack themselves a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or something or grab a bag and their suitcase and they just walk out the door. You know, they get as far as the end of the driveway. And then they're like, now I don't know what I'm going to do. 
I have nowhere to go. Like what they thought was freedom is now absolute terror. What they thought was going to be freedom and solve the problem has now only made the problem worse. If you think freedom is running away from your problems, you have missed the freedom that God is calling us to. Somebody's given me an amen. Our ultimate freedom is found only in Christ. Here's the great goal that we have, is to discover that ultimate freedom, that freedom that would sustain our children even if their faith was not popular, that freedom that would sustain our children even if the government put them in prison, that freedom that would sustain our children if the rights that we take for granted were taken away. There are plenty of believers who don't live in our country who have found the freedom that only comes from Christ. In the Gospel of John, there are uh, several references to this freedom. John chapter 8 is the uh, very best one to study, and so we're going to look at a few of those verses here for a moment. In John chapter 8, starting in 31 and 32, Jesus is having a conversation even with the Jews who had believed in him. And so talking to them, Jesus said, If you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Verse 32, Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We love that free part. The truth will set you free. Plenty of people love to get to that last line. They misquote that last line all the time. That's a terrible last line to stand all by itself. They just say, well, if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. But that is the conclusion to that if-then statement that Jesus gives. Jesus begins by saying, if you hold to my teaching." The starting point for freedom is the teachings of Jesus. In our church, as a mission statement, we constantly hold out the goal that we should know Christ and make him known. If you truly want to be free, you have to know what Jesus teaches. You have to know what he says about how we treat one another and how we look to him and who he is. If you hold to my teaching. That is not an easy thing to do. And so we want to encourage you as you work through this series to spend time in your Bible, to ponder what this means, to be a part of Bible studies, and to really learn. Uh, Our women's group coming up here, the Beth Moore study, uh, the Beth Moore study in the summer has become our largest single Bible study that we do as a congregation. Kudos to all of you women. Right? It's a women's only Bible study, and it's the largest single Bible study we have. So it starts coming up this summer. Uh, it's a great time of fellowship, uh, and so we encourage you to sign up for that starting today to be a part of that out there. To find ways to hold to the teachings of Jesus, because if we hold to his teachings, then we are really his disciples. And then, only then, will you know the truth. to know the truth. Is there any greater goal that we should have as people than to know the truth? Right? Some of you are like, well, I just want to be happy. Just make me happy. Happiness is not our ultimate goal. It is to know the truth. Because knowing the truth will ultimately bring us the joy that God intends. It is truth that will set you free. Uh, Truth is not always easy. Uh, One of the assignments that I give when I do premarital counseling is I ask the couples who are going to be married to go talk to their parents. Because you know what parents do when you're growing up? You know what you do when you have little kids, at least some of us? We try to protect our little kids. Right? So little kids think their, children, think their parents are generally perfect. Right? They think that you, uh, as a parent, are, are the person who knows everything, which is great. That's exactly how it should be for your children. 
The problem is, as children move into adulthood, they also they can have this unrealistic expectation. They can assume that uh, going into perhaps a marriage, that their marriage will be as perfect as their parents was. And that's a bad misconception. Uh, so I ask them in premarital counseling, I say, go talk to your parents and ask them about their, their conflicts, about when they fight, about how they dealt with all of that. Because while it might not be easy, it will set you free to realize that all relationships have conflict, that every place in our lives is a place where the devil seeks a foothold, that the very freedom that God gives to us is too often turned into a place where sin can make us its slave. Jesus continues after telling them uh, that the truth will set you free. In verse 33, it says, They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we should be set free? And Jesus replied in verse 34, Very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. If you want a scripture to memorize, let me encourage you to memorize John 8, 36 uh, in these next several weeks as we head towards Memorial Day. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Uh, Memorial Day comes out of primarily the civil war in our country. When mothers in both the North and the South mourn the loss of their husbands and their sons and their grandsons to a greater degree than any other war since then. More casualties in the Civil War than any other battle, any other war we've ever been in. And particularly for those of us who come out of that heritage in the North as believers... It is essential for us to understand that the willingness of those sons and fathers to give their lives, the willingness of those mothers to send them to the battlefield, came out of the belief that God had ordained that all people should be free. That when we claimed as a country that we are given inalienable rights by our Creator, that all people had those rights, that all people knew that same divine spark within them. Freedom did not mean that they did nothing. In fact, freedom meant that they would be willing to die to set others free themselves. That is quite a sacrifice. And mothers understood better than any the depth of that sacrifice that was made. Now, today is the day that most phone calls, the, the highest level of phone calls is made from prison. Did you know that? The highest level of phone calls is made from prison today. Now, urban, urban legend says the lowest number of phone calls is made on Father's Day. Now, the influence of mothers could not be overstated. The desire of mothers is to see their children know life and liberty, truth, and the pursuit of happiness. And so flowers today are for our mothers, for all of those who raised us and who gave us life. The flowers that we'll put up on the altar in a few weeks on Memorial Day are from the heart of mothers. And all of those who would honor the sacrifices that our soldiers have made across the years. Uh, Joyce Pennard came in earlier this week and already turned in her uh, flower uh, card for us. It is God and your mother who gave you the life that you have. The first great right of all people is to life from the moment of conception until the day that God calls us home. To believe that that right doesn't come 
from the government, that that right doesn't come from any person. It simply comes because that's how God designed us, is a great gift. But it is also a great responsibility. We praise God today for each day of life that we have, but you should also praise your mother because God used your mother to give you that first and great gift of life. But both God and your mother hope that you will understand your liberty and your happiness. I'll say a word for your mother this morning. You need to hear her prayer for you. You need to understand her hope for you. To get the most out of Mother's Day is not to give your mothers flowers or chocolate. Anna Jarvis agreed with me completely. So what is it? What does your mother want for you? To clean your room finally. Get on the ball. No. Your mother wants you to make the most of the gift that she gave you. And she prays that prayer that comes from that heart. And whether that prayer was prayed 80 years ago or 8 months ago, whether you heard that prayer from her or whether it was only ever silently lifted up on her heart, whether you knew her all your life or you never knew her at all, you are surrounded by the prayers of a mother who would hope that your gift of life would lead you to a, to a day's of freedom and happiness. But the only way that freedom and happiness is found is for us to be willing to know the truth. I pray that you would remember your mother today, your grandmother, your great-grandmothers, and all of those who have come before us. But not only would you remember them, but you would act in such a way that you might stay truly free today and always. As we prepare to close today, I want to lift up the invitation. If, if you're in need of those prayers today, if something in you calls out and says, God, I want to be free, if you've never made that commitment in your life and yet your mother prayed for you every day that someday you would know Jesus as Lord and Savior, then today is the day to make that decision. Today is the day to make that commitment. Maybe today is the day you pray for someone else. Maybe as a mother, you desire to come and pray today for your children. And as always, the altar is open. Let me pray for us as we prepare to close. And so, God, we thank you this morning for our chance to come in the freedom of our country to give praise to the God who made us, the creator of the universe, the Savior, Jesus the Christ. Lord, the freedom to welcome you, Holy Spirit, into our hearts and lives, no matter the condition around us. We pray that we might have a deeper and better understanding of the freedom that you give. We pray for this congregation in this community that we might use the freedom that we have to share the good news with all who need it. And wherever there is bondage to sin today, we come before you, Lord, and ask you to break it. For we give it all to you and do it all in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen.